Um, so, so what we are trying to do is to fuse machine learning and optimization in a way that uh, we can achieve things that independently they could not do. And so that's really the goal. Um, so it's going to be really be many of the things that you will see are cooperation really between machine learning and optimization. So we are not replacing optimization with machine learning or machine learning by optimization. So this is, uh, this is optimization, right? So you get an input. I'm going to try to see if this works. We have an input. We have the optimization, uh, the optimization solver. We give a model. We give an instance. And then we get this beautiful output. So what's not to like, right? So you get an optimal solution. And, and you, may, you may say, but why do we need machine learning? And so I think one of the things that we were thinking about is what are the situations where really uh, the two technologies together can do things uh, that are interesting. And so the opportunities is obviously when machine learning is too slow. And what we have been exploring is essentially two settings, and you'll see them during the talk, is one where the real-time constraints are such that the optimization model is really too slow, and the other one is going to be... And the other one is going to be when we have this very large simulation that would take a very, very long time, and therefore... Um, uh, you want to speed them up so that you can do things that you, you could not do otherwise. So what we do to do that, and this is one of the ways to combine machine learning and optimization, you have seen many other ways during the first two days of this, um, of this workshop, is by replacing the, the, the optimization model uh, by, by a machine learning proxy. And so we call this an optimization proxy, so we have the same input as before. Uh, then we go through this machine learning, you know, this machine learning model, and then we get the same output or an approximation to the output that uh, we had with the optimization solver. Now, there are some interesting things that I want to mention here, is that we are in an ideal situation when we do these optimization proxies because we can generate the ground truth the way we want. We can just generate as many instances that we want, solve them offline, and then learn from them. So it's not like we need to label the data, we have an algorithm to do that. So this is what I'm going to talk. I'm going to give you some preliminary, a little bit about power system, because many of the applications that I'm going to talk about are in power system. But you'll see some other application in scheduling uh, a different and, and routing at different parts of the talk as well. And then I'm going to talk about all these topics. I won't list them now, but you'll see them you know, happening during, uh, during the presentation. So uh, power system, uh, the energy system is the largest machine on Earth, just in the United States. It ships about uh, four, you know, $400 billion in electricity every year. And this was a slide from a few years ago. It's probably a bigger number now. It's a very complex network that has to satisfy both physical and engineering constraints, as you will see. Uh, it works very well. We have lights almost 99.9999% you know, of the time. Uh, but there are some challenges that we are facing now. And the first one, obviously, is that many of the, uh, many of the uh, grid operators are trying to push as much renewable energy in their grids at this point. And that means wind and solar, and, and, and so these are sources of energy that are not as controllable as the typical you know, um, uh, generators that we had for the last century. And so you have to take into account that volatility, and I will show you some of the issues that come from that. And the other thing that is happening also is that the load itself, load is the demand in power system, is much more difficult to predict because you have distributed energy resources now, and you have a, a significant um, electrification of the transportation system as well. So that gives you a, a, a lot of challenges, and I will talk about them in the context of uh, uh, the MISO system. MISO is the mid-continent uh, independent system operator in the US. They operate the grid from Canada to New Orleans in, uh, in Louisiana. Uh, they have about 40 million customers and about 70,000 uh, you know, uh, kilometers of transmission lines, miles of uh, transmission lines. Big system. Uh, they are trying to push the renewables. They were 17% of renewable about uh, six years ago, and they are trying to get to about 32, 33 percent in the in the in this decade. Um, so the challenge is, as I told you, the increased volatility in both in generation and load, and that gives you also an increase of prediction error. So what you see there uh, is essentially that the, the 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 prediction error in a system like MISO have been increasing by an order of magnitude. You also need fast ramping of the generators, and you have to you know, uh, uh, plan for that, which, because essentially if you lose all the wind, all the generators have to step up and make sure that uh, they are actually meeting the, you know, meeting the load at that particular point in time. It's also a lot more difficult now to actually find the right resources that you need in a system like that. And so uh, many of the operators in the US, for instance, are trying to make these uh, studies for finding out what is the, 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 you know, the resource that they need for uh, meeting the load at every point in time. 
And finally, we are living in a very different world now, uh, and the pricing will have to change at some point because for a wind farm or a solar farm, generating electricity has you know, zero marginal cost. And most of the, most of the pricing mechanisms now are based on, on marginal cost. So this is, a, this is the MISO pipeline. I'm going to talk about it. Uh, but roughly speaking, what you have to understand is that there are two kinds of decisions. Some are discrete, and that's which generators you commit at every point in time. And then some are the continuous, is, you know, which generators are matching the load at every point in time. This is the pipeline, uh, and this is a little bit how it works. This is a you know, crash course in um, 30 seconds on how you know, um, systems in the US are working. It's very different of, uh, in Europe, but you know, there are similarities. So the day before, at around 10.30, um, every, every generator, every load is uh, putting some bits, and you have what is called a security constraints uh, 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 unit commitment, which will decide which generators are, be are being committed for the next 24 hours, for every hour. Uh, a couple of hours later, about six to seven hours later, you have what is called a, a, the FRAC uh, for, for MISO. It's a reliability commitment. Uh, you, you are actually using the forecast in addition to the bid because some people are playing the market are not necessarily truthful. And you have to actually find out if you actually need, based on this forecast, to commit more generators uh, to ensure reliability of your system. So this is, again, the day before. Then every 15 minutes, we, you have what is called a LAC. It's also a reliability commitment. Uh, but what you are deciding there is generators that can start very fast because you do that every 15 minutes. And once again, you use the, the forecast which has been adapted. And then finally, you have the real-time market which is executed every, every, uh, every five minutes. And then the grid does what it does and you get new conditions and then you, you keep going. Uh, so what, one of the things that we did in the team and, and Mathieu Tano led that, that development, we, uh, we, basically, uh, we basically had a, a complete pipeline of the MISO. We replicate, we have a digital twin essentially of, of MISO operation. Now you have to read, I mean Mathieu will tell you, I have read uh, this business, um, business manual. There are thousands of pages describing how this works. And you know, in addition to that, there are many things that are not in the manual that you need to do when you build these digital twins. Uh, it's a big, big effort. You know, many people, uh, about 50 code repository, about 50,000 lines of code in Julia and Python. And it integrates every, every, everything for reproducing this pipeline, forecasting algorithm, market clearing algorithm, risk, and uh, also the, the, optimi the machine learning algorithm. I'm going to talk about you know, many of these aspects, but not some, some of them not in detail, obviously. Uh, so I won't talk very much about uh, uh, forecasting, but this is also a very interesting area for machine learning where there has been a lot of progress in the, in the last couple of years. So we do uh, forecasting, obviously, for everything. We also uh, generate scenario uh, so that we can do stochastic optimization. Uh, to do stochastic operation, we have to bundle some of the assets because there are thousands uh, of wind farms, and then we have to gen you know, find the right scenarios to optimize the games. Uh, this, is a, this is something that I'm really happy about. This is a, this is a prediction for load for 48 hours. Uh, you see the scenarios there that are generated. Uh, you see also the forecast. You see that the forecast is very precise and the scenario are almost always you know, including the ground truth, which is very useful when you do stochastic optimization. This is based on of temporal fusion transformers, as, uh, taking into account also weather forecast and obviously very, uh, a large number of historical data points. Uh, and also copula method for actually generating smooth scenarios. So this is, uh, this is, sol this is solar. Um, once again, it's a temporal fusion transformers to do that. This is like an hour. Uh, this is like um, six hours. I love this because that reminds me when I was young and playing a roller coaster. Uh, but you can see once again that we, we are capable of predicting these things to a, a very high fidelity. This is the, so what I'm going to show you now is essentially the system, uh, the, the, the MISO pipeline, but replicated on the French system. I can't show you the MISO data because this is in the United States control uh, information, but I can, we replicate it using the French system for which we have a lot of, uh, uh, we have everything essentially. And so what you see there on the left is the energy dispatch, the big generators are the nuclear generators, there are many in France. You see the black one, which are the, the coal or you know, gas generators. Then you see solar in, in, in yellow, if I remember correctly, and, and wind in purple. On the right side, you see the reserve. That's what you are committing uh, uh, to make sure that if something happens to the generators that are, are producing energy, you have something that, that can uh, step up and, and, and uh, provide the necessary energy. Now, this is every, every hours, and you can see that uh, 
you know, you can see that the commitments are changing every hour. And this is something that I will come back to, 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 to talk about when we talk about the commitments and, the, and some of the machine learning algorithm. Um, so this is the look ahead. This is every 15 minutes. And what you see again is that things are changing very rapidly. Even at the 15 minute level, you can see that the commitments and the reserve are changing. So it's not that the system is evolving slowly. Every 15 minutes, you see very different commitments. And this is every five minutes, and again, you're going to see the same thing. Every five minutes, things are changing very fast. So it's very interesting. So this is a very dynamic system. It's not, you believe that it's stable, but actually it moves all the time. So that was a big surprise, at least for me. Uh, so let me talk about optimization proxies now. So this is the core, uh, and it's an academic version, obviously. I'll talk about the real problems later on. But this is the core of uh, what it means to optimize a power system. This is the, what is called the ACOPF. And you see the engineering constraints at the top. You see the physical constraints at the bottom. They are obviously non-convex. These are equality constraints, which are quadratic. I mean, in this particular case, that's the, uh, the, the, the hybrid forms where you see the trigonometric functions. Uh, so what we want to do is build this optimization proxy for this ACOPF. And so uh, in a sense, an optimization proxy, as I told you, is exactly the same as an optimization algorithm. You have the input, which is the, the, the load, essentially the real and the reactive load, and then the set point of the generator is the output. That's what the proxy has to learn. Uh, there, were, there are many, many um, research papers on this. I won't go over them, uh, but I'm going to tell you the story of, of you know, uh, essentially how you can start with, uh, start with you know, essentially a vanilla network and then go to something that can uh, scale to very large network. This is, the, this is the learning problem, obviously, nothing, nothing very fancy. Uh, you see the input uh, and output, uh, which are, as I told you, the load and the, the demand and then the, the set point of the generators. You're trying to find this optimization proxy where you minimize uh, the loss function, which is essentially being as close as possible to the ground truth. Now, one of the difficulty here, obviously, is you have this, all these physical and engineering constraints. And you have to actually satisfy them for this system to actually be reasonable in practice. Uh, so this is the vanilla uh, deep learning. Uh, one of the things which is interesting, we talked about that in the first, you know, a couple of days in this in this um, in this workshop, is the fact that you know this is not an, a, a traditional feed-forward network. We are trying to actually uh, have a neural representation which take into account the feature of the application. So you have some embeddings at the beginning, and then you have the, the prediction for the uh, for the uh, real power and then the voltage magnitude. Um, so, so how do we take into the constraints? Um, so I'm going to talk about uh, Lagrangian duality here. So what we do is the first thing that we do is we take the constraints of the problem and we do a, what we call a violation-based Lagrangian relaxation. We look at the violation of the constraint, violation of the equality constraints here, violation of the inequality constraints. So it's not your typical Lagrangian relaxation. We only care about uh, the violation of the constraints. And obviously, we have the Lagrangian multipliers over there. So this is how the network is looking like. When you do that, you obviously have to take into account uh, you know, the, the values which are ha happening in the constraints. So you have to see, uh, you, have to only, you have to have the phase angle, uh, you, have to have the, you have to have the reactive power now, and you capture the, the, the physical load, Ohm's law and Kirchhoff's law. And obviously, uh, once again, you, see, you can see the architecture which is based, you know, which is exploiting the, the, the structure of the application. And then you see the loss function now, which combines you know, this, this, these violations as well as the risk minimization, which is a little bit larger than, than before, because now we have also to take into account the phase angle and reactive power. Uh, no, th this is how you compute a violation, obviously, for every constraint, you have a Lagrangian multipliers. And one of the questions to do is to, to, to decide is how are we going to choose that value. And this is where I want to show you the first, you know, right of nice synergy between uh, optimization and, and machine learning. We are, you, you know, if, obviously, if you know the multipliers, you can train this network in a very natural fashion. But again, you know, we want to find, so think of this as a, a kind of, as a relaxation, right? So we are learning, you know, it, theoretically, you can always find a network that's going to compute this, this relaxation exactly, right? But obviously, what you want is to find the right, you know, you know, multiplier. And that's where Lagrangian, you know, duality comes in, where you're trying to find the multipliers that are, you know, maximizing, in a sense, this, the value of this relaxation. And so that's what we are going to do. Um, yeah. So uh, how do you do that in practice? Typically, what you do is you, you, use, you use two steps. You first learn for a particular value of the Lagrangian multipliers, and then you have a dual step for uh, upgrading uh, the multipliers. Uh, 
Uh, one of the things that I wanted to tell you is that if you try, if you use a traditional neural networks, you know, optimizer like, you know, Adam or RMS, and you let them choose a multiplier, you, you don't get really good results. So they don't know how to balance these two things, and that's where Lagrangian duality is very useful. Uh, so, you know, I told you what, what, a, what an optimization proxy was, but, you know, I'm basically, you know, hide uh, from you a, a, an important part is that uh, what we are doing with this machine learning model is actually a regression task, obviously, at this point. And most of the constraints will not be satisfied. So what we have typically in this proxy is another step, which is a feasibility restoration. So really a proxy is this combination of we are predicting and then we are restoring feasibility. Now, how you do that is actually very interesting. It's a topic on its own. And I will give you some hints at different parts of the talk on how we do that in practice. Ideally, we would like to do something like this, where we try, try to find the feasible point, which is as close as possible to the prediction. And that's what you can solve with, you know, using this problem. Again, this is, a, this is an optimization problem, which is non-convex. Some of these constraints are not convex. And it may be as hard as the original problem, right? So it depends what your constraints are, what your relaxation are. But this may be actually uh, very difficult to solve, uh, for instance, for an interior point method. Uh, one of the things that people are using in power system is what is called a power flow. Uh, what they do is they fix some generators to some values, and then they satisfy the physical constraints. Pascal. Yep. So what is difficult? Uh, I mean, there are two components here, right? I mean, one is discrete and one is continuous. So also in this problem. Currently, it's continuous, but I'm going to get to the discrete afterwards. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So this is, yeah, you'll see the discrete aspect later on. Okay. Currently, it's, currently, it's purely continuous. Okay. Non-convex, non so, non-continuous. Uh, continuous. Uh, continuous means that the, the decision on uh, which uh, generator, which uh, uh, generators are uh, are uh, active, is already taken. Yeah. So in this, I'm assuming I know the generator. But you are right. So this, I'm telling you, I'm telling you a story. I'm telling you a story, and you're going to see that the story is going to get much more complicated. Okay. So this is the, the academic part of the talk. Um, so we, we apply this to um, uh, we apply this to a variety of problems. So you're going to see a lot of the French network. These are two subset of the French network. This is high voltage, and this is high voltage plus the Lyon region, uh, where the food is very good and uh, the grid is complicated. Uh, and so what I'm going to show you is a comparison between a vanilla model where you ignore the constraints, uh, a model where you fix the Lagrangian multiplier to, to a constant value, and when you use Lagrangian duality. And so this is the first thing that you can see here. Look at the active power there. Uh, and it, this, this is probably not surprising for many of you in optimization, but if you, put, uh, if you, if you fix the Lagrangian multipliers, what's going to happen is that at some point, you, know, you won't be able to improve the max uh, violation. It's going to be stuck at a particular value. Uh, the Lagrangian dual you know, works really nicely. Uh, the vanilla network, su surprisingly, is actually pretty good in general. Um, but it, you know, it still has an order of magnitude more violation than um, the Lagrangian dual. Vanilla network is an MFP? It's a fully connected network. Yeah, so this is, a, this, is the, yeah, this is the entire French network at the bus, at the, at the node level, right? So we have all the lines, we have all the transformers, we have all the sh uh, phase shifter. It's the actual network, the real actual network. It's without restoration. This is, no, this is, uh, this is no restoration, but I will show you restoration in a moment. Uh, this is, the, um, this is the, the accuracy, and this is actually very interesting, right? So you see the generators there? They are ordered from left to right by the amount of power that they generate. So this is the one which has the most power. This is the, the y-axis here is the power in, uh, I think it's megawatt, yeah? You know, so this is one gigawatt at that particular point. And this is the scale of the error. So you see this is four orders of magnitude smaller. So you can see that, you know, these this prediction algorithms are actually uh, outstanding. Uh, this, is the, this is to answer Tia's question, which is, uh, we was anticipating only two slides this time. Uh, but this is when you restore feasibility. This is with the projection method. This is with the power flow. And you can see that you know, the precision here is very high. For the half voltage net network is 0 0.03, uh, which is well beyond the market clearing algorithm in the US. In the US, you want the optimality gap that you want for the market clearing algorithm. The algorithm that clear the market and do dispatch is 0.5%. So this is well, well within those, uh, those, those bounds. Um, this is the training time, uh, and obviously this is interesting because this is the time that it would take on, on the Lyon part of France. So this is again about four or five orders of magnitude smaller. So you can do things that you could not do otherwise with, this, uh, with these proxies. Um, 
No, but you see, these are not, they're still not real network. They are big, but they are not real. So uh, what we started to do is to say, can we actually push this such that we can solve really the French system? And this is where we actually were looking at Lagrangian decomposition. So if you have a system like this, you may say, oh, you know, maybe, you know, typically, and this is typically what happens in this power system, they are loosely coupled, different regions are loosely coupled. And if all you can say, hey, I can predict this one, I can predict this one, and then, you know, I can scale to much larger problems in a sense. Uh, so this is, for instance, France. France is operated around 12 different regions, and you know, they, they have you know, kind of controllers for every one of them, and obviously they synchronize globally. Uh, but this is a very natural thing to do in this network. Now, the problem, of course, is that you don't know, uh, you don't know the coupling flows there. And therefore, you know, what are we going to do? In a Lagrangian decomposition in optimization, you would have an iteration and you know, uh, make these things um, uh, you know, as close as possible using, again, a Lagrangian dual. Um, but here we don't have them, so what do we do? So we have essentially a two-step approach where the first thing we do is we, we predict the coupling flows and then we learn the regional system. And the reason we can do something like this is because when you look at the number of coupling flows, they are much smaller. It's like an order or two orders of magnitude smaller. So they are really loosely coupled region in a sense. They are, coupled, they are coupled, but they are loosely coupled. And therefore, you know, this is a much easier machine learning problem. And also the, the flows you know, in these coupling lines is much smaller than the overall flow of the system. System. And you can see here a system like, you know, France is there, and uh, this one is, an, is, a France, is France with some part of the European network as well. Uh, so this is, a, this is the benefits of optimization. I love these pictures because um, you can see on, in black, uh, you, see the, you see the Lagrangian dual there. Uh, you see it there, which is essentially kind of here. This is for a particular generator. It's like a, a nice regression, but it doesn't capture all the, you know, all the non-linearities of the generator. The ground truth is in red. You don't see it because most of the time it's below the blue line. And you can see the blue line you know, moving, and that's essentially the Lagrangian decomposition method. So we are capable you know, with that method to actually uh, compute a much more, uh, you know, follow the, the non-linearity of the generator much, in a much nicer fashion. Uh, these are some of the results and the, the errors, that the, the, the optimality gap that, uh, that you have. And you can see that now we scale with very small errors uh, to, to large network. Uh, you can also see that you know, on the smaller ones, we actually improve by using this Lagrangian decomposition. Uh, so let me talk about some really recent work, uh, which was actually pretty interesting. So um, the, some of the RPAE projects are generating larger and larger network. Uh, some of them have about 13,000 buses, or so 30,000 buses actually. And we said, hey, can we actually do that again? So this is the latest test, test case that we were looking at. Uh, you can see things like 300,000, 300, uh, 30,000, 30,000 buses there, 13,000, 30,000. They are very difficult test cases. You can also here see the dimension of the output. So the dimension of the output for this one is 67. So it's very different from a computer vision system where you are basically classifying an image, right? One output or you know, some small number of outputs. Here we have 67,000 outputs for, every, for this particular problem. The input dimension is also very, is very large, right? So it's 21,000. So how do we do that? And so the key point is uh, we, we actually realized that uh, if you do a principal component analysis on this system, on the largest, on the largest one, one of the things that you see is that the variance is actually, is actually captured by very few of these, uh, of these principal components. And this is, a, this, you know, the bad news was on the previous slide. This is a good news. So the, the system is, you know, there is a, uh, the variance is explained by very few components if you are in the right dimension. And this is in contrast to some of these vision test cases where you don't have a, as nice, you know, uh, you don't capture the variance with so few principal components. And so can we leverage that? So what we do is that instead of learning uh, like we have done so far, you know, input and output, we are actually learning in the space of the principal components. So we basically have a, a, a learning problem which actually predicts something in the space of the, of the, you know, the Z there is in the space of the principal component. And then we map that back to the output that we are interested in. And so this is the algorithm that does that. So we call it compact learning. But what it does is incremental, you know, it, it uses, you know, mini batches. The mini batch are updating the principal component. And then they are basically uh, doing this, this, you know, uh, 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 training step as usual on, on these mini batches. 
And so the results are, are quite interesting. I'm going to show you first that the number of parameters is, is, is much more. We keep, we keep the number of, of parameters under control. This is in million, right? And so this is the, the approach that I've shown you so far. And you can see that they grow very, very fast, right? So we have 200 million you know, parameters there. And these are still very small. Well, I mean, they are reasonable test case, mid-sized. Uh, but you know they, they don't scale to this very large uh, system. You can actually have a, 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 the, the traditional approach, but make the, the network much smaller, and then you can scale. Uh, but still, you know this is this is this is actually uh, working with with a, a, a much reason, a much more reasonable uh, representation there. Uh, these are the results as well. Uh, you can see that once you do that, you get really nice accuracy in terms of the optimality gap, and instant uh, after restoration, obviously. And then, and then this is the violation. Uh, this is a violation also uh, uh, when you are just when you are training. So it's a big improvement compared to the other methods uh, when you learn into this space of of principal component. Yes, Tias. So what's the difference between using the PCAs and just an embedding of the same size? So you, you, you could try, but here, I mean, we are, we are basically using inside the learning. We are, we are actually driving this by doing, the, doing kind of an incremental PCA. Uh, we are leveraging the power of doing the, the, the PCA algorithm inside the training, in a sense. So it's really, we are, we are leveraging that automatically. We don't, we don't need to actually discover that embedding, in a sense. We know what we are looking for here. You see what I mean? And so we can we can explore during the we could do the we could do the PCA before, but doing it incrementally is actually much more effective in a sense. Okay, you see what I mean? So you have actually embedded inside a training algorithm a learning of the PCA incrementally as well. You see what I mean? So you don't have to discover this. You are you are using a dedicated algorithm to do that during. So training. you're learning or you're applying. We are, like so there's, is the weight matrix also within? So you're learning the double, the double, so if you look at this thing, we need this W matrix, and you are learning it uh, incrementally using these mini batches. That's what you're doing. But you are using a dedicated algorithm to do that. You are not just letting the neural net try to find that. We, we know what we want to do here, right? You see what I mean? Uh, yeah, so, so one of the interesting things is that we are actually not only learning the primal solution, we are actually learning the dual solution, which is actually very interesting, because when we actually use this, PCA and, and compact learning, one of the things that you see there is that if we see an interior point method like you know, IP opt, you can have very significant benefits up to a, a factor of, of six here on the friends network. So by seeding the, the interior point method with both of primal and dual, uh, we, are actually, you, we can actually use that to seed the, uh, uh, the, the interior point method and get significant benefits. Okay, so uh, one of the things that you have seen is that we are actually using dedicated uh, neural architectures, dedicated to the problem. And this is one of the things that we do in other settings as well. And I just want to go to a, a discrete problem to make sure that uh, Andrea is happy. Uh, so we are, uh, we are using a job, shop shop scheduling here. And the, the framework that we are studying here is that we, we, are, you know, we are the day before and you know, we want to account for the fact that some machine may be delayed on the next day and, and may be slowing down. And we want to be able to react to that very quickly. So we train a network to actually do that. And one of the things that you see there is, once again, we, we're going to have embedding here uh, for the machines and the jobs. And we separate them. And then we have the, the joint layer, the shared layer afterwards. So again, we are using a dedicated architecture here, which takes into account some of the structure of the application. And obviously, we have a feasibility restoration phase here, which is a linear program. So it's uh, you know, actually uh, very fast. Uh, if there are cycles that may happen in the prediction, I mean, it never happens in practice, but it could, uh, then you have to resort to a greedy algorithm. But you can always restore feasibility here. And so what is interesting is that when you do this, uh, the proxy is amazingly faster than the state of the art. This is, um, this is the CP optimizer solver for this particular problem. And you can see that you know, in milliseconds, uh, we can actually do better than the solver sometimes uh, after, you know, even if we give 30 minutes to the solver. It's not always the case. Uh, this case is, you know, we are worse, you know, uh, but we, you know, but it takes a long time for the, the state-of-the-art solvers to actually uh, get to the same quality as we have. Uh, once again, there are things that I wanted to tell you here is the fact that we have uh, the, the dedicated architecture uh, is actually giving you uh, uh, much more, you know, accuracy. Uh, and, and has fewer violations. So this is, there is a really big impact by using this dedicated architecture. And the value of, and the value of this dedicated architecture plus learning uh, is actually very significant when you compare to the heuristic that would run in the same time. So it's an order of magnitude or two orders of magnitude better than that traditional heuristic that people are using. Um, 
so, so this was a warm up, right? So I want to go back to the real problems now. Uh, so this is MISO, and the first thing that I wanted to tell you is that when you look at the real system, things get a little bit more complicated, and this is another paper that we wrote. And so when you look at the MISO system, as I've shown you before, you're not only optimizing energy, but you're also optimizing the reserve, uh, how much you have to provide such that the system can recover if something happens. Uh, typically in practice, they use a DC model, not an, AP, an OLC model, but with line losses and some ramping constraints. Uh, you capture the generator contingencies as well, and you also have a, a variety of reserves that you have to provide. There are about eight reserves, uh, if I remember correctly, inside, uh, inside the MISO system. So the input is the same as I've shown you before, except that we have the commitments of the generator. Again, this is, was a question by uh, Andrea. So we have, we'll have commitments, and I'm going to show you something interesting in a moment. Uh, we have ramping constraints, and we have the various kinds of reserve, regulation, spinning, and so on and so forth. The output is the active power, but also the reserve. So it's more, it's more complicated. So this is the bad news. The bad news is that if you look at a system like MISO or the French system, uh, you're going to see that the commitment of the generators for every hour of the day is very different. So on a particular day in winter, every, every hour of the day will have different generators' commitment. And this has a big impact if you think about it, because it's like the topology of your network is different. You are generating you know, uh, power at different parts of your network now. And so this is a really bad news, because that makes the machine learning algorithm much more complicated. You have you know, kind of completely different topologies of the, of the network to learn. This is the good news. In a system like MISO or in a system like the French system, about 60% you know, of the generator are fixed to the minimum or the maximum. Uh, the one at the minimum, they have to be there for some reason. The one at the maximum, they are the cheapest one. You want to exploit them as much as possible. So there are about 40% of the generators which are in the middle. That's what we really, if we could predict the other one, this one, these were the ones that we really need to focus on. So how are we going to exploit these two things, the good news and the bad news? So what we do, this is the size of this, this problem. So they are very big. So this is like, you know, I'll, I'll tell you really the numbers later on. But this is about three quarter of, uh, three quarter of a million uh, of inputs for this particular problem. So what we do is instead of training a one single model, we are going to train a dedicated model for every hour of the day, such that we can actually focus on the single commitments of the generator. So the day before, we collect all the data, we augment the data if we need to augment it, and then we have a machine learning model which is dedicated to every one of the hours of the day, such that we don't have to deal with different topologies. And then we have this classified and predict architecture. We try to classify the generators, whether they are at the minimum, at the maximum, or you know, they are in between. And then we can focus on the rest, which becomes a regression problem. For the regression problem, we use this latent uh, surgical intervention architecture that was uh, used by uh, people at RTE. And so the results are very interesting as well. Uh, compared to the baseline, we always improve the baseline, sometimes substantially. And we have, again, very, very small uh, optimality, uh, uh, very small you know, uh, errors in the prediction. And that results in very small uh, optimality gap. Uh, this is something which is interesting here. Uh, so what you see here is that the accuracy of predicting this single model is much better than predicting a single model. So you have benefits in accuracy when you are doing you know, this just-in-time uh, learning. But this is the most interesting point. So what you gain is, uh, is, uh, is significant in speed. By, by actually training these small models, uh, you know, 24 of them, you are much faster than training uh, the, you know, a model that would cover everything. And that model actually would not fit into the time requirements of the, of the, of the power system. It would take too long. You don't have the time to do it uh, for the next day. So one of the things that is really nice is once you have these proxies, uh, you can start doing risk assessment. Now, the day before, you can, so this is a risk, you know, energy, um, you know, energy operator likes to understand the risk in their system. And so what they have to do is execute the entire pipeline that I have shown you for, you know, for every point of the day. And so you have this, uh, you have all these, you know, uh, frac and lack, and then the security uh, economic dispatch that I've shown you that you have to execute. This pipeline is taking about 45 minutes for one scenario, right? And you have to use, you know, thousands of them to actually evaluate the risk. So you can do that the day before, so you can assess the risk the day before, you have some time to do that. But if you want to do it in real time, it's extremely difficult because, you know, you cannot, you know, do every five minutes something that takes in the, at least 45 minutes for every scenario. So what do we do? So I'm going to show you examples here from the French system again. 
So we are basically using these proxies instead, and now we are predicting every one of the quantities of interest. So what you see there, this is the reserve requirement. You see that we are below the minimum res reserve requirement that is you know, um, required for every one of these systems. And so we can predict that for some of the scenarios, there will be some issues there. And then you can predict the probability of this. That's what you see there. And then you can, you can actually uh, predict the cost that this would uh, give you. Now, one of the nice things here is that we are capable of actually assessing the risk of this system in real time now. Uh, we are not completely precise, so we are working on the, and, and we should have results soon about this as well. Uh, but currently, we, are, we can predict the risk almost, you know, when there is a risk almost always, we can overestimate or under, underestimate the risk sometimes. So there is more work to be done, but this tells you, you know, things that could not be done before and you can do with these proxies. All right, so let me uh, go, continue on the discrete part. And what I want to talk about now is these reliability commitments. And this is once again a, a discrete problem again. And so again, the dimension of the problem is really large, about three quarters of a million for the input. And uh, one of the things that we want is to make sure that we, we provide the operators with very reliable prediction. This is what you want to do. This is the confidence in this recommendation. Because in most of the system, most of the, most of the, most of the partners uh, that we work with, uh, there is always a human in the loop at some point, whether it's in supply chain or in energy. They are actually looking at the recommendation and deciding because these supply chains or these you know, uh, energy systems are you know, high stakes. Uh, so what we did here is actually using a, a completely different in infrastructure. It's an encoder decoder with graphical neural networks. And we are trying to actually assess the, the confidence that we have in every one of the decision. And then again, we have a fast visibility restoration. Uh, so let me talk a little bit about the encoder and, and decoder. Uh, once again, I told you the dimension of this problem is super high. So three quarter of a million just the input um, and then about 25,000 know, know, decisions that we make. You can see all the things that need that are needed for actually uh, inside the input for every one of the generators and, and so on. So the first thing we do is that we have these embedding layers uh, for the generators and the bus. And then we go through these layers of the, of the, of the graph neural network and then we have the decoders at the end. Uh, so the decoders for the graph neural network, we actually looked at different architecture, the convolutional ones, as well as the sign, uh, sign infrastructure. As you will see, it doesn't make you know, too much difference. The sign infrastructure, the, the sign architecture is a little bit better, uh, but I would not say significantly better. Uh, so this is the, kind of the results. Again, it's on the French system. And what you see here, what is interesting is that the various, the, what is important about this graph neural net compared to some of the baseline is that they do well when it's important. When it's not important, they, they just bring minor improvement. Uh, but in, in a system like the French system, most of Europe, uh, the, the months which are important are December, January, February, when it's cold and you really need uh, you know, uh, additional generators. And so you can see that there the improvement in the, in the prediction, the commitment accuracy is, is growing. Um, you can see also the dimension, the number of trainable parameters. And once again, what is nice about this graph neural network is that they exploit the sparsity of the network and therefore they have, a, they have only you know, 2 million parameters or something like this. So how do we measure con you know, confidence? So, so, so we want to actually find out the decision by which the, the, the network is actually confident in, in, the, in its decision. And so we, we output not only the prediction, but the confidence in every one of these commitment uh, decisions. And so we use MC dropout both you know, during, during training and then during, um, during, uh, during prediction times. And so we basically use a lot of different passes and then we can you know, find out the, the, the consensus decision, but also the uncertainty, which is uh, the, 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 the uncertainty in the decision. And then obviously the, the confidence is gonna be the, the, the inverse of that. And that's what we give to the, to the operators. And so this is actually very interesting. The, the results are very interesting. Once again, this is a real system, right? So this is MISO, the real, the real system here. And so one of the things that you see there is that, uh, you know, for about 40% of the generator, we have 99.9% .9 confidence. And then it decreases a little bit as you go. And uh, if, you, if, you you know, if you take all the recommendation, uh, the accuracy drops to 98.1%. So there is, a, there is a gap between these two things. So how do we exploit that? How do we, how, how do we communicate that? Uh, so that's the, the topic of the next step. So typically what we do when, when we try to provide this recommendation to the operators, we fix the commitment that we are confident, and then we restore feasibility for those. They can still violate some constraints, obviously. 
Um, but those, the fixing those is actually reasonably easy because this is only the ramping constraints and things like that. A lot of the constraints are soft in a system like MISO. And we can do that generator by generator. There's a beautiful algorithm that was proposed by other people that we are leveraging here. And then afterwards, another thing that you know, we can use for speeding up is predicting which lines are going to be tight. So that also allows us to actually speed up the feasibility restoration. So these are some results that uh, when we really want to give the operator you know, feasible solutions. Uh, so here we are actually only using the, you know, the, which lines are going to be violated or potentially tight. Uh, so this is the second thing that you see here is that here we are fixing the, the, the number of generators. This is the, 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 the we are fixing let's say 30 percent of the of the confidence in, of the, the generator by by confidence level and so on up to 100 percent. And so what you see here is that if we don't restore feasibility, you see some infeasibilities there. Uh, and this is where we do everything. We predict the line that's going to be tight. We 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 uh, fix the various types of generators, and then we restore feasibility. And so you can see that there, you know, you, we have significant speed up again, like a, about a factor of four in this particular case. Uh, so that's what I wanted to tell you about this as well. So how much do I have left? Uh, around eight, nine minutes. Okay, I'm going to skip this one. This is too bad because this is really beautiful. Uh, but this is one of the things that we did for uh, actually accelerating, um, accelerating um, uh, ADMM. Uh, the, the basic results here is that you can use a proxy for a particular distributed algorithm and you get amazing speed up. Uh, you actually get from, uh, you, you can do in about 10% of the time uh, by actually uh, predicting, uh, predicting the, the, the consensus variables for this distributed algorithm. But, you know, I think we have heard a lot about reinforcement learning in the, in, the last, uh, in the last two days, so I want to talk a little bit about reinforcement learning. So I'm going to focus on a completely different application. So this is a ride-sharing system uh, that uh, we are using the data from the New York uh, City uh, taxi uh, test cases. And so the, the goal here is to actually look at uh, people making requests, uh, things, uh, think Uber and Lyft, but with ride-sharing. And we are trying to cover this with as few, um, as few vehicles as possible and have a very fast response time. So how do you optimize that in practice? Uh, you use a, a essentially optimization plus a model predictive control. So every, every 30 seconds you optimize. You have about 400 requests in New York City every, every 30 seconds. And I'm going to show you how we do that. But then at some particular point in time, let's say every five minutes, you relocate the vehicle such that they are close to the demand. OK? Uh, so this is the real-time optimization. Uh, you, you batch, you optimize, you batch, you optimize, and so on. And so the, the optimization algorithm is a, is a column generation uh, algorithm where uh, we minimize waiting time, which is very difficult because the pricing problem becomes a nightmare when you do that. Uh, but we also have, we cover every one of the riders. That's one of the features of this algorithm. And uh, we have a, a, the way we do that is by having a, a, an exponential uh, pen, a penalty, which a penalty for uh, uh, unserved riders, which increase exponentially. So after a few periods, you know, you have to serve them essentially. Uh, these are some of the results uh, of the, this basic algorithm. You can serve uh, you can serve all the customers with about 2,000 vehicles. There are about 12,000 taxis in in, in uh, New York City, uh, with a waiting time around 3.6 minutes. So this is nice. Now this was very nice, um, and I was very happy until I asked my students to actually show me. Uh, the utilization of the vehicles. And so blue are the vehicles which are idle, and you can see how pathetic this algorithm is because you see a massive amount of vehicles that are completely, uh, uh, that are completely idle. And it takes a very long time for the algorithm to actually dispatch them at the right place because you know, serving something in this area which is very high demand, uh, you know, this would increase the, the, the waiting time way too much. So these vehicles are essentially badly utilized, and this is in the north and the south of the city. So, so can we do better? And this is where this uh, model predictive control is, is, uh, you know, is useful. So we have an optimization algorithm to relocate them at the right place. So you see, for instance, at this point of the, where is this? Uh, oh yeah. At this point, you see these vehicles here. And they are actually idle, but at some point, the whoops, you, see, you saw it happen now. They are basically being relocated to some regions which are uh, more, uh, where there is more demand. Uh, so when you do that, you again decrease the, the waiting time by about 25-30%. Uh, but I want to show you how we do this. So, so uh, this, is the, this is the way you optimize that. This is a MIP. And this is a pretty ugly MIP. It's very difficult to solve. And so you can solve it for two or three periods. But if you want to do more than that, it's very, very difficult. So in a sense, uh, this MIP can only be solved in real time for a very small number of periods. So what, what are we going to do? 
Uh, we're going to learn it, obviously. We use a proxy. And the interesting point is that this proxy, so we learn this, we, we run these, you know, we run, you know, uh, instances offline uh, for about six periods, and then we learn them. And what you see is that the proxy is almost as good, or, you know, in a sense, as good as a, a model predictive control, which uses six periods, but to, that you cannot run in real time. And so this was, uh, this was super cool as a result. Uh, but uh, we, we also wonder if we could do better. And this is where reinforcement learning is coming into the picture. Uh, the, M the, the model predictive control here is still limited. Six periods of time is only 30 minutes. So we don't capture long-term effects. And so we wonder if we, uh, if we could actually capture this long-term effect using reinforcement learning. Because we have, you have this simulator and we can actually run it, run it, run it, and see, you know, observe the trajectories. So what we implemented is a deep reinforcement learning with the proxies I use instead of the MPC. And so uh, what we do is that around every decision that we do, we have Gaussian noise and we can explore things around the decision that we are recommending. So if we you know, relocate five vehicles, we can say, hey, what about six or what about four and so on? And we explore that. And then we have a policy gradient optimization to actually um, optimize this. Uh, I'm skipping this. Uh, but the result interesting here is that this obviously, you know, not changing the waiting time because we are trying to capture long-term effects. So the waiting time was essentially not changed. So we still have a very nice, you know, waiting time for the riders. But what is uh, what has changed is uh, the relocation algorithm, which is actually improving by, if I remember, uh, you know, correctly, between 10 and 20 percent. Uh, so we are really, you know, being more conservative in the way we are relocating the vehicles and not as reactive. Uh, to, uh, to the demand at a particular point in time. So this is also a nice combination between optimization proxies and reinforcement learning. Uh, so let me conclude now. So I think we are, we, we, there is a, a lot of exciting times in front of us. This is like, you know, baby steps in a sense. Um, but we are, uh, so what I've shown you is that we can actually uh, use these optimization proxies to solve problems that really could not be solved independently between machine learning and optimization. And so, um, so I, you saw, you saw you know, various things where we are actually using insight from optimization into machine learning when we are using machine learning for improving some of the optimization algorithm as well. And so I think there is much more to be done in that area, but this should give you a sense of uh, what we are trying to do in the, in the institute. So thank you very much. Thanks, we have plenty of time for questions.